Thank you for joining us uh, this evening for this opportunity of learning and conversation about the history and future of Liberia. This is part of our ongoing conversation about the historical audit on Princeton Theological Seminary and Slavery, which was released last month. We've had a number of opportunities to discuss this, including an entire afternoon on the 17th. But throughout the year, we'll continue to look for other opportunities to talk about different aspects of that report. In fact, a, a, a forum uh, for conversation, uh, particularly focused on students, is being planned. You'll be hearing more about that from the Dean of Students very shortly. Later next spring, there will, in the semester, there'll be other lectures and also an academic conference on the topic. Throughout the whole year, all of these events are being overseen by a task force made up of faculty, administrators, trustees, and students, and, uh, and alumni. And the purpose of this task force is not only to oversee the various events in response to the audit, but also to solicit suggestions from the seminary community as they then try to pull together a slate of recommendations that they'll be bringing to the Board of Trustees in May. After each of these events, we want to encourage you to think about how you can communicate with this very important task force. The address I put up on the board, it's just slavery.ptsem.edu, and they'd be eager to have any suggestion that you would like for them to receive. And we've been collecting quite a few as well already, but we're gonna to continue to collect them into next semester. So please feel free to communicate to the task force. You can also ask them questions, uh, but particularly suggestions for how best to respond. As we've learned, part of our family's story is uh, our seminary's very active involvement uh, amongst our seminary founders and some early faculty members in the American Colonization Society which advocated the sending of former slaves to Liberia. As we confess this history and its continuing legacy, it's important for us to be in conversation and to learn about the Church of Liberia today. This is a vital part of who we are as a community of faith and scholarship that we seek to not only understand what did happen, but the legacy of how it continues to unfold into the present. We are blessed to have as an important member of our Princeton Seminary family, a dynamic leader, not only of the church, but of the nation in Liberia, Dr. Sam Reeves, who is with us this evening. I have the honor of introducing one of our board members, the Reverend Dr. Daryl Armstrong, who will then introduce Dr. Reeves. Reverend Armstrong is the pastor of the Shiloh Baptist Church in Trenton. He's a graduate of Princeton Seminary and has served on the board of trustees since 2010. Reverend Armstrong is a very gifted pastor and community leader. Shiloh Baptist Church has a thriving ministry and community outreach program in Trenton. The church is also engaged in relationships around the world, including with its sister congregation in Liberia, the Providence Baptist Church, where Dr. Reeves is pastor. Reverend Armstrong will also be a part of a delegation from Princeton Seminary that's traveling to Liberia, Ghana, and Nigeria early next month. This group, which also includes Professor Afe Arogami, Dean Jacqueline Lapsley, will be visiting congregations and theological schools to listen, learn, and build relationships, along with Dr. Shane Berg. I'm grateful to Reverend Armstrong for his service to Princeton Seminary and for all that he's done to make this evening possible for us. Would you please welcome Reverend Darrell Armstrong. Uh, my job is real easy because the Reverend Dr. Sam Broomfield Reeves uh, Jr. is a dear friend and brother. Um, I believe it was probably in 2008, 2009, um, when Pastor Reeves and I reconnected um, after our seminary experiences. And so for those of you who are in seminary, um, as we say in your undergraduate years, don't, just don't ever ad underestimate when these paths may cross again. And not that we underestimate, I think we had an idea that as two black students at Princeton Seminary and students of African descent, um, that we needed to stay in relationship with one another. But I don't think he nor I really had an idea 
of what our friendship and professional relationship would blossom into. Um, I was always uh, an admirer of Pastor Reeves' move back to Liberia. Um, he had what I would estimate, and I think he has even said, a comfortable ministry in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, after earning a Master of Divinity degree here um, and a Doctor of Ministry degree here, I think he was probably in the last class of the DeMint students or among the last class of Princeton's DeMint students. And um, the Lord led him to uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he was a one of several pastors of a multicultural, multi-generational congregation there in Grand Rapids in central Michigan and did a phenomenal job in bringing issues of diversity to bear on that congregation. Um, but in the midst of all that, he said he heard the Lord and the Lord's call was to go back home. And uh, like Abraham, get out, uh, it was a reverse um, call to go back home, not to get out of your father's land, but go back to your father's land. And um, that call was to go back to not only his native Republic of Liberia, but it was to go back to the church that was home for him. And that church was the Providence Baptist Church, the first church Christian house of worship in the Republic of Liberia, founded by Reverend Lot Carey himself. And for those of you who know the Lot Carey Foreign Missionary Society movement, one of the largest African missionary movements in the world, um, it is that movement that bears the name um, of the founder of this house of worship. It was in this house of worship that the Constitution of the Republic of Liberia was signed. It is in this house of worship that heads of state come, presidents and vice presidents and senators, to um, hold major press conferences. And, um, and so shortly put, the Providence Baptist Church really is seen as the church of the nation. And when Reverend Dr. Reeves got the call to go back home, um, it was shortly after the second uh, well, it was shortly after the Civil War that really had ripped apart um, Liberia's fabric of um, civil society, I would say. And so it was a rebuilding time. And not many of us, and maybe I should say even for myself, I probably would have struggled um, to leave a place of comfortability, to go back home to a place of uncertainty, but with a place of certain call that God is going to be with me. And so Reverend Dr. Reeves did that. And since then, he has been doing what I consider just an amazing job of spiritual and ecclesiastical and social leadership in his native country of Liberia. I'm so taken by Liberia and his leadership that I've made it a seminal part of the ministry at the Shallow Church in Trenton to not only adopt him, it, the church as a sister church, but to really send teachers and engineers and other leaders within our congregation with him or with us to do whatever we can do to build um, that relationship. One of our leaders is here today, Deaconess Miata uh, Stella Herring, and she has been one of my main, stand up, raise your hand there, this Miata, one of my main points of contact in um, the relationship between Liberia and Trenton. Trenton has the second largest population of Liberians outside of Monrovia, the second largest population of Liberians outside of Monrovia. The first is in Minnesota, if I'm not mistaken. And so for many, many reasons, we are connected to the ministry in Liberia. And um, I feel I've been over now about seven times and uh, we've stopped staying at hotels. I now stay at Hotel Sam Reeves. Uh, <laughs> He's, he, the Lord has blessed him to build a growing house, and why would I give $200 a night to the hotel, Royal, when I can give it to my brother and support his ministry? And so when we bring groups over, we now try to reside and resort at Sam Reeves' house, um, literally, and take up his house. Uh, <laughs> And so I can go on and on about my admiration and our friendship. Uh, let me just say this about what is going on here at Princeton. Um, for many reasons, I am amazed that we can be at this space at this time when boards, member, board members of this institution set a theological framework that helped really give birth to a nation. We are at what I consider to be one of, if not the epicenter, 
of the colonization movement in America. Princeton, New Jersey, the last northern state to free its slaves. Princeton, New Jersey, where Paul Robeson sang, acted, lived, grew up not too many miles from here. Princeton, New Jersey, but not only because of the American Colonization Society, but I would even dare say before that in the American Revolution, colonization was not first thought of in Liberia. It was also conceived in Sierra Leone because on Sierra Leone is where many free blacks who fought against the Americans in the Civil War moved from Canada and resettled by the British movement of colonization back to Africa. And I would dare say a lot of those skirmishes happen right here in Princeton. And so it's a double interesting phenomenon about colonization here in, in, in Princeton, New Jersey. My brother's ministry, he garnered a million dollar grant from the DeVos Foundation to build a school, hospital, and clinic, and a church right on the border of Sierra Leone and Liberia. And so for all the reasons Sam Reeves is Mr. Um, is at the epicenter, I should say, of America's colonization movement, whether he realizes it or not. And so it gives me great honor to bring my brother up, my friend and my colleague, um, and a trusted confidant to give this lecture, which is seminal in the history of this institution, in the history of his country, and it has amazing repercussions for the future of our seminary, and really, I would say, our country. So put your hands together, help me welcome the Reverend Dr. Sam Bloomfield Reeves. Thank you. It's good to be here this evening and to see all of you, many of you faces I left here many years ago at Princeton and it's good to see you again. To President Barnes, thank you for the privilege to Pastor Armstrong and other officials here at Princeton. It's good to be here. But let me warn you, I'm a Baptist preacher. <laughs> uh, I expect an amen every now and then. <laughs> All right, and I hope if, if I'm getting too long, you'll make the amens even more. And I know I need to shut up and sit down. Amen. Thank you. Today we want to talk about the discussion of the history and future of Liberia. A few of you have asked me today, what is your topic and what are you talking about? And I've shared just with some of you. Um, if, I, if I am to draw on a theme title for this lecture, it would be the role that Princeton Theological Seminary and Providence Baptist Church played in shaping the history of Liberia, and what can both of these two institutions do to transform lives and renew communities today? Thank you. Implicit in my presentation today are three interweaving themes. A personal testimony that create, created a spontaneous consciousness, a penetrating mission of meeting needs holistically, and a practical theology of making a tangible difference in post-Civil War Liberia, Africa's oldest republic, and a pace-setting recommendation and next steps of how Princeton could turn the tides and do something positive for Liberia's future development. I will show how these stimulating teams have led me into ethical reflection and action as part of a leading, as part of leading the historic Providence Baptist Church 1821 to engage in poverty alleviation I hold strongly that transforming lives and renewing communities can be genuinely achieved in a moral community. But let me begin by reflecting, begin this reflection by providing a brief overview of Princeton's early influence of the history and formation of Liberia, and then lead to the current political, social, economic, and religious context 
within which this project is happening. Robert Findlay and the American Colonization Society. In 1787, four years after the 11-year-old boy had entered the College of New Jersey, later renamed Princeton University, Robert Finley graduated at the age of 15. Later did he know that 60 years later in 1847, he will be singularly credited with being the creator of Liberia, Africa's first independent republic. Robert Finley, a Presbyterian minister, born in Princeton, New Jersey in 1772, licensed as a minister in 1794 by the Presbytery of New Brunswick, and served as a trustee of the university in 1896 during the turbulence surrounding the issue of the day, the institution of slavery, rare and cultivated around its culture and existence, tool and refined and educated by Princeton, may read it with Princeton's liberal arts and classical education and theology. The young Finley, as all Princeton graduates before, and after him was launched into a waiting world to demonstrate his best. Confronting the issues and ills of his day, charged with the responsibility to make the world a better place for all humanity. It was in this spirit and confidence that the 44-year-old Reverend Dr. Robert Findlay, the future president of the University of Georgia, accepted the invitation of his brother-in-law, John Cardwell, upon the behest of Charles Fenton Mercer, a Federalist, member of the Virginia General Assembly, who as a consequence of the Gabriel Process Rebellion had come upon earlier state legislative debate on black colonization. He led to lead, rather, in forming an organization for the repatriation of blacks to Africa, the home of their nativity. On December 21st, 1816, the American Colonization Society, ACS, was officially established at the Davis Hotel in Washington, DC, with Princeton graduate, Dr. Finley, as its founder whose in attendance, or those in attendance included James Monroe, Bushwell Washington, Andrew Jackson, Francis Scott Key, Daniel Webster, with Henry Clay presiding over the meeting. Its co-founders were considered to be Henry Clay, John Randolph, Richard Blend Lee, and Bushwell Washington, all members of permanent American families. Several will go on to become presidents of these United States. It will be the ACS which will champion the creation of Liberia, leading to her independence in July 26, 1847. Over the life of the ACS, about 13,000 Blacks will be repatriated to Liberia under the auspices of the society. Liberia, since its independence, has experienced her own set of growing pains. Unique in her own respect and from inception, found herself existing in tension as she tried to mitigate a workable solution of coexistence between those repatriated, the settlers, and those met in the new homeland, the Aborigines. All this is happening amidst 20 to 25 years of tension in these United States, leading to the Civil War in 1860, and eventually the passage of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1865, free the slaves. Struggling to survive in a hostile 
environment of Western colonial powers, the new nation had to adopt a policy that would direct her focus for development. With all but the United States, major players on the world stage spinning on monarchy and dictatorship, Liberia would, like her parent, America, adopt a constitutional democracy based on Christian principles. This political system and policy would alienate all the other religion, Islam and African traditional religion, and lifestyle, African traditional cultural practices, systems, and laws within the newly created territory of Liberia. 133 years after independence in 1980, Liberia will experience one of the world's bloodiest military coup. Many scholars will attribute the Liberian rebellion to the coexisting policies between the settlers' children and the children of the Aborigines. The upheaval will lead to over 25 years of instability, civil insurrection, conflict, a 14-year bloody civil war, and the sacrificial death of about 10% of the nation's population documented to be between 250 and 300,000 deaths. At the end of it all, the 2008 census would confirm that 86.6% of Liberians profess to be Christians, a small and partial vindication of the intent and purposes of Liberia's founding fathers and mothers. The recent 2017 Liberian elections put political power, in my estimation, in the hands of Liberians of all stripes, all tribes, region, ethnic affiliation, including the settlers' children. The current political, social, economic, and religious realities. After nearly eight months into office, our current president, George M. Weir, has, the, for the first time, was able to address the 73rd session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York after the United Nations mission to Liberia on mail closed its peacekeeping activities in Liberia after 15 years of operations. Since Liberia assumed security responsibilities in 2017, there has been no major security problems. The country's security forces successfully produced security and provided security rather for the 2017 presidential and legislative elections. President Weir told the world body of his ambitious economic manifesto, the pro-poor agenda for prosperity and development which he says gives priority to the alleviation of poverty with focus on reducing the marginalization of the most vulnerable. Creating a conducive atmosphere, he says, for the middle class and upper income Liberians to grow and prosper and contribute to the country's development. The president promised to build a harmonious society based on the goals of economic empowerment, especially for the underprivileged. The poor, pro, poor agenda is designed to give power to the people, promote economic diversification, protect sustainable peace, and encourage good governance. Liberia's economy is still struggling to recover from the effect of multiple shocks in recent years, namely the Ebola virus disease outbreak, the collapse of commodity prices, the United Nations mission in Liberia withdrawal, and the perception of risk associated with the political transition in January of 2018. 
real gross domestic product growth in 2017 is estimated to have recovered to 2.5% and is projected to rise to 3.0% in 2018. The incipient recovery is driven largely by the increase in production of gold and iron ore, following an uptick in the price of gold and iron ore on the international market. Non-mining sector GDP growth remains very low. The agricultural sector growth remains subdued due to weak recovery in the global prices of rubber and oil palm. Headline inflation continues to rise during the year, reaching an all-time high of 24% in June of 2018 and 10.8% 10 the same period last year. The resultant rise in the cost of living and limited employment opportunities continue to undermine the welfare of Liberians. According to the 2016 Household Income Expenditure Survey, more than half of the population, 50.9%, is, is living in poverty. Poverty is more than two times higher in the rural area, 71.6%, than in the urban areas, 31.5% and is overall lower in the capital city of Monrovia than the rest of the country. The fiscal deficit widened to 5.2% of GDP in fiscal year 2018, compared to 4.8% of GDP in fiscal year 2017, due to a, a significant shortfall in revenue and higher than anticipated non-discretionary expenditures. The medium-term economic outlook is optimistic, to say the least, despite sustainable downside risk. These include a further slum in commodity prices, income, incomplete structure and institutional reform, and risky borrowing. The new administration is expected to mitigate these risks by embarking up upon policies of reform that will promote economic diversification, improve investment climate, promote domestic revenue mobilization, and to ensure prudent borrowing strategies. Christianity is by far the most common faith in Liberia, with recent survey showing Christian making up of 83% to 86% of the population up significantly from surveys of the 1980s. By contrast, Islam is on the decline slightly from 14 to 15% in the 1980s to 11 to 12% in recent surveys. Traditional religions and non-religious individuals have seen greater decline as well. Christian denominations in Liberia include Baptist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, uh, Roman Catholic, United Methodist, African Methodist Episcopal, African Methodist Zion Episcopal denominations, and a variety of Pentecostal churches. Some of the Pentecostal movement are affiliated with, affiliated with uh, members of churches in the United States and others are just independent Pentecostal churches. There are also members of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, and the Seventh-day Adventists. While most Christian churches are meeting spiritual, emotional, and psychological needs, few have yet to get on board with addressing the urgent and widespread economic needs of their communities. And I can be a proud pastor to say it is in this sense that Providence Baptist Church through the Providence Foundation distinguishes itself. Providence Baptist Church, a Providence's contribution to holistic ministry transforming lives and renewing communities. In early 20, uh, 2002, 
I was sitting in the basement of my Grand Rapids home without any expectation. I received an ordinary call that had extraordinary, extraordinary implications and impact that would change my life forever. That call came from the such and the nominating committee at Providence Baptist Church. There is a vacancy at Providence for the position of senior pastor. Your name has been nominated. Would you consider? The voice on the other side of the line, in tune with measured calmness and a hint of excitement mixed with carrying out the necessity of a robust institution. While serving as the co-pastor of Madison Square Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, I was privileged to form a church-to-church -church partnership relationship of mutual giving and receiving with Providence Baptist Church. This relationship affords both congregations the rare opportunities of building a cross-cultural people-to-people relationship that continues to expand both congregations' mindset of God. And uh, Dr. Olson is here, plus others, and this, this relationship actually form my doctoral dissertation here at Princeton. Thank you. The goal of this partnership is to discover together who God is and God's global mindset in the expansion of his kingdom. This partnership allows members of both churches to experience God and God's work in a completely different environment, culture, ministry, and denomination. In 2005, my family and I, after much prayer and trepidation, decided that God was calling us to return to Liberia. In fact, when I first told my wife that I felt the call, she said, you must be tripping. <laughs> I haven't heard the call yet. <laughs> but soon we realized that the call was for both of us. After several trips to Liberia, I realized that the conditions in post-Civil War Liberia were similar to the conditions in Grand Rapids, Michigan, especially in the immediate neighborhood where Madison Square did ministry. Prior to my, to my return in Liberia in February 2005, I was convinced that, like Nehemiah, it took innovation, creativity, ingenuity, and a holistic approach to the transformation of lives and renewal of communities to rebuild all of Liberia's walls, including her spiritual, emotional, physical, and economic walls. Providence Baptist Church has its roots firmly entrenched in the history of Liberia and affectionately, nationally and affectionately recognized as the cornerstone of the nation. It was founded in 1821, right here in the city of Richmond, Virginia, with the Reverend Lot Carey, the first African-American missionary to the continent of Africa. The Declaration of Independence of Liberia, the nation, was signed in the old edifice of the church, our Independence Hall, on July 26, 1847 thereby Liberia's second birth from the church. And throughout, you would see we were talking about the two Ps that led to the formation and history of Liberia, Princeton Theological Seminary and Providence Baptist Church. Upon my return, Providence had an active roster of about 350 members in attendance weekly the church was surrounded by a bustling urban community, Nestor in central Monrovia, yet rampant poverty was visible, but the church needed to be far more viable. As senior pastor of Providence Baptist Church, where we've been serving for the past 13 years, the congregation has grown to over 2,000 in active membership, not just on the roll, but active. This congregation has been transformed into one of the most spiritually, socially, politically, and economically conscious churches in Liberia. Providence's outreach ministry ring with preferential treatment for uplifting the poor, the vulnerable, and the hurting. The congregation currently ministers 
and feeds about 500, between three to 500 men, women, and children every Friday in the basement of the church. We are in the process of building a homeless second chance model center with vision for senior house complexes. We have established a divorce village on 25 acres comprising of a medical center, a junior and senior high school, an IT center housing units, Ebola orphan children's home providing a home environment for orphans and parents of the deadly Ebola disease. Located in Grand Cape Mount County, Western Liberia, in the Bull Waterside region where we minister to and form inter-religious dialogue with Muslims and people of other faith practices. We have established strategic plans of extending the congregation's vision of mission and community development around the country, ranging from child, pro child care program for low-income families to after-school programs for battle boys and girls to empowering Liberians in the pursuit of skill development, business and asset development in an effort to reduce and or eliminate poverty. In our commitment to minister to the whole person and empower Liberians to improve their livelihood, we have established in the spirit of economic development and poverty alleviation several businesses including the Providence Water Company, several farming uh, projects including oil palm and rubber, the Liberia Entrepreneurial and Asset Development, uh, a microfinance institution, in fact, one of the leading microfinance institutions in the Republic of Liberia. At LEAD, we see the creation of a middle class as essential to the stability of Liberia's economy and for the development of the nation's business sector to improve entrepreneurial skills and livelihood of all Liberians. We focus on assisting those who have the passion and determination to improve the livelihood and reshape the business sector in our burgeoning economy, burgeoning economic environment. Empowering individuals with specific skills and capabilities and abilities and propensities for, for enterprise can create employment <laughs> opportunities, not just for a few, but also for a larger sector of the population. The call to transform lives and renew communities is a call to spread the love of God through a holistic approach to the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people. Our approach to evangelism and mission must encapsulate economic development and personal empowerment that leads to the alleviation of poverty. Underpinning our philosophy is this hunting question. How do we turn the least of these into the best of them without losing our souls? When people are empowered, they are able to generate employment and create jobs for the many who are in dire poverty. The church, I believe in this case, Providence Baptist Church, has a divine calling to challenge believers to use their gifts and their talents and resources, their skills and and services to further the kingdom of God and glorify the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As the church evangelizes, it must proclaim and promote that the use of one's gifts and skills should reclaim, retrieve, and redeem the marketplace. Ethical practices, compassionate service, and faithful accountability should all be reflected reflections of the person of Jesus Christ in our lifestyle, our work, our service, every day of our lives. We are able to bring glory to God through the administration um, of the resources entrusted to us when we allow decent moral practices of the gospel to lead what we do. Whatever you do, Paul declares, work at it with all your heart as if working for the Lord and not for men. Recommendations and next steps of how Princeton can turn the tides, make a redemptive difference in Liberia, and do something positive for her people. 
Princeton can take as much or even more credit for the creation and establishment of the Republic of Liberia as any other, including the government of the Republic of, of the, the government of the United States. It was Robert Findlay, born in Princeton, New Jersey, a graduate of Princeton and the seminary, with other Princeton graduates and powerful political protagonists with ideological principles rooted in benevolence that established the American Colonization Society, which formed and nurtured Liberia into existence. It is therefore befitting to have such a conversation at this time, in this gathering, and even more befitting for Princeton to take up itself the Liberian experiment as a project and take some responsibility that will guarantee the survival and ongoing flourishing of a nation. It is therefore my recommendation that the partnership be established between Princeton University, Princeton Theological Seminary, the Providence Foundation, the Providence Baptist Church, and the government of Liberia, that a private-public partnership fund be established and managed by a reputable foundation in Liberia and these United States, led by a Princeton grad. That the fund be divided in two parts, that the interests of the first part be used to, per to perpetually guarantee quality education for the children of Liberia, and that the interests from the second part be used to ensure perpetual development of Liberia that the government and other developmental institutions in Liberia will submit development projects that meet the criteria of the greatest benefit to the greatest number of people. And the, pro the project must show how it will be sustainable and finance itself over time. This effort, I believe, will allow and enable Liberia to combat and smoothly ride the waves, improving and maintaining her original intent of building a constitutional democracy based on Christian principle in the face of growing global nationalism and Islamic fundamentalism. Conclusion. In a sense, transforming lives demand that we merge our intelligence and integrity in the service of empowering others to be all that they were created and called to become. And changing communities require that we use our character and competence holistically to address the social, political, and economic well-being of others transforming lives and renewing communities is the art of bringing Christ-like action and attributes together out of a spirit-filled and abiding commitment to love God and thus make a concrete different difference where we live, where we room, and where we gave. Thanks for this opportunity. It's been wonderful being with you.